When I was 16 years old, there were two things that happened to me that would shape my life. The first thing is my father gave me my first guitar. And I'm telling you that calling this thing a guitar was really generous. I love my dad. But (laughs) it was really more like a box with some strings on it. Um, And I think it only had four strings on it. And I'm pretty sure I played it out of tune for the first year. But I love this guitar. I was like the only little black girl in the hood with a guitar. And I just absolutely loved it. The second thing that happened when I was 16 was my brother was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison for a robbery where no one was injured. My brother Dwayne was everything to me. He taught me how to ride a bike. He taught me everything I know about black culture. And in an instant, he was gone. And Dwayne was sentenced to such a lengthy uh, time because of our state's policy of mandatory minimums, or sometimes people will refer to it as three strikes and you're out. So the judge had no discretion. The minimum time that he could give my brother was 20 years. So because of Dwayne's experience, I knew that I wanted to work in the criminal justice field. So for the past five years, I worked as a public defender where I represent people Um, who are accused of crimes but can't afford an attorney. And because of that little box guitar, I'm also a soul singer who tours internationally. I often tell people there is no way I could be a public defender if I did not also have music. And I'm going to tell you why, but first I want to just give you a little insight of what it looks like to be a public defender. So despite the five million crime dramas that we have on television, where the noble prosecutor cross-examines the sinister murderer while the jury of multicultural peers pensively looks on, (laughs) you killed her, didn't you? And the jury comes back within 10 minutes with a guilty verdict, and the prosecutor gloats with pride as justice has once again been served. The courts in this city and many cities across this country look nothing like that. It looks more like poor black and brown bodies, mentally ill, drug addicted, being brought into court to answer for often petty crimes. It looks like public defenders tasked to advocate for someone before they can even ask their name. It looks like my 16-year-old client coming from a holding cell with his head bowed, his hand cuffed behind his back to answer for his charge, riding his bike without a bell. It looks like my 71-year-old client with fragile shaking hands sentenced to one to three years in state prison for driving on a suspended license. In this court, It is not uncommon to hear the cries of the mentally ill struggling to understand why they just can't go home. There is one moment in this court that I will never forget. I remember watching the deputies bring a boy from the holding cell, and he looked to be no older than 13 years old. His hands were shackled, and he was so small that he was drowning in his green jumpsuit. I watched as a deputy placed a box at the podium so that he could step on it to reach the mic. The judge arraigned him without a blink. The defense attorney entered a not guilty plea without a blink. And I looked around at all of us, all of the adults in this courtroom, His village, when did we forget that this is a child? When did the word defendant become more important than child? You see these labels like defendant, inmate, convict, they tend to supersede any other identities that a person might carry. 
We hear those labels and we close ourselves off to the rest of the story. If I said to you right now, I have a person who needs a place to stay and I like them to stay with you for the weekend and they're a convicted felon. You don't have to answer, but I want you to sit with what happened to your mind when you heard the word convicted felon. What if I instead said, that person is my brother. Labels are powerful. I'll never forget when I was in undergrad and my brother wrote me a letter. The resident assistant came running down the hall in front of everyone screaming, oh my God, you got a letter from an inmate. You got a letter from an inmate. To her, inmate meant someone to fear, to be afraid of. But to me, that was my brother who taught me how to ride a bike. Just recently, I watched a presidential candidate uh, being interviewed, and he was asked a question by a reporter. Do you think felons should have the right to vote? You know, felons, like mass murderers and sexual predators? The candidate said, absolutely not. And the crowd cheered wildly. You know, felons like mass murderers and sexual predators. But here's the thing. Murders and rapes make up less than 10% of the crimes committed in this country. The people that we are denying the right to vote are more likely to have driven on a suspended license, committed a property crime, than they are to have killed or harmed anyone. And I want to be clear that I'm not saying that people who have committed violent crimes are less deserving of compassion. But my point is that we cannot continue to make policies or build systems based on flawed perceptions. We have created a system that is frankly beneath us. We have created an archaic system that says, the best way to deal with crime is to lock someone up, in, someone up in an eight by eight cell until they figure out what they did was wrong. This is not rehabilitation. This is pure punishment. And a system that is purely punitive lacks any transformative or redemptive power. It lacks love. And we are so much better than that. I spent countless hours in these courts, from rural areas to the suburbs to the city. I've represented thousands of people. There are times where I represented 50 people in one day. I remember thinking to myself, how often can I speak to men and women in cages before I forget that I am speaking to human beings? The heaviness of this all was never lost on me. I was always aware of the way that race and poverty played in this system. And maybe I felt it deeper because this was my community. These black and brown faces were my faces. These were my cousins, often literally my cousins, my brothers, my sisters. These were my people. And I can tell you this, there were times that I was angry. I was frustrated, especially when I would be asked by people, how do you defend those people? Or you defend the bad people, right? I could have easily given up on humanity. But I have this other part of me. I have music. So I could be so frustrated during the weekday, but on the weekend, <laughs> music gave me a place to pour out all of my frustrations. I could stand in front of hundreds of people and tell them about what was happening in that courtroom, and I was received. Music healed me. But it wasn't only what music did for me. 
It is what I witnessed it do to other people. Music reminded me that all hope is not lost because at our core, we are beings with a deep capacity to feel, to relate, to empathize. Music revealed to me the tenderness of the human heart. See, I could get on stage and I could grab a mic and I could immediately connect with hundreds of people. There's a rebel inside of me, said a girl who knows what she wants to be. Oh, there's a dreamer, there's a dreamer inside of me, said I won't stop till we're all free. Oh, freedom, freedom. Oh, freedom, freedom. Music. <laughs> Thank you so much. Music makes us feel, doesn't it? Maybe you listen to your favorite artist and you get goosebumps or you listen to them sing a song about heartache and you feel their pain as if it was your pain. That is empathy. And I've witnessed that from New York City to Poland to Brussels to right here in Rochester. But there was one show that I will never forget. And that was at Attica State Prison. My brother was incarcerated in Attica and he invited us to do a show there. He got permission for me to bring my whole band. That's how awesome my brother is while in Attica. So we brought our whole band to Attica. And it wasn't so much that we were in Attica or that this was for my brother, but it was what I saw music do in that moment. A place where people are literally separated by walls, where labels like guard and inmate are strictly enforced, I slowly watched music erode those labels. I remember there was a man who had been in Attica for about 40 years. He got on stage and he grabbed the saxophone and he played in a way that brought most of us to tears. But there was one small thing that I noticed while I was in Attica. I remember watching the guard standing very stoically, very serious, taking care of business. And we played this one song, and I noticed that while the top of the guard's body was very stoic, that bottom foot was tapping. <laughs> and I looked around, and I noticed all of the guards tapping their foot. Then I looked at the incarcerated men clapping their hands. And I noticed in that one moment, both guard and inmate clapping on the same beat, fully present to the music. And I know, I know I'm not the only one who felt the power of that moment. Right after that song, a guard came up to me and he said, you know, I could have been any one of those men with different circumstances in my life. I could have been wearing the other uniform. A person who was incarcerated in Attica would later tell me, for that one hour that you played, it felt like we were all free. And when I tell that story, the takeaway might be, music is powerful. But for me, it's bigger than that. We are powerful. Music is just a vehicle that reveals what is already existed within us. We are hardwired for empathy. We are social animals who thrive on our ability to connect, to collaborate, to clap on the same rhythm. We are so much better than we know. 
And I watch this happen all over the world continuously. What music reveals is that we have the capacity to feel, to empathize, to love. And we can tap into that part of ourselves at any moment. And with two million people incarcerated in this country, what better moment than now? The system that we have does not reflect the best parts of ourselves. But we can create solutions that do. But just for now, maybe the next time you hear the word inmate, convict, defendant, and even if there is no music playing, will you remember that you are a human being and you have a deep capacity to feel, to empathize, to love? Thank you.